In this talk, we're going to cover the most exciting three to four milliseconds of your life. That's the action potential. It's a series of depolarization, repolarization, and an after hyperpolarization. It's going to ultimately lead to the release of neurotransmitters. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the ionic basis of the action potential. We'll review the terms depolarization, repolarization to make sure we know we're on the same page. And we're going to talk about the structure and the function of voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. Those are the bread and butter ion channels for the action potential. But there are some additional conductances that we do need to consider. And we'll talk about those at the end. We'll start off by just walking through an action potential. During an action potential, the neuron is going to rapidly change its membrane potential from that negative 70 resting value up to a positive, roughly 30 millivolt value. Then back down, it'll dip a little bit in the after hyperpolarization and come back to rest. And in the cartoon world, it'll look a little something like this. Once we hit threshold potential, which is the membrane potential at which we fire an action potential, we're off to the races. All we need is a little bit of depolarization to get us started. Now, when we're talking about depolarization, what we're talking about is removing the membrane potential. Cells are going to rest at minus 70. So if we depolarize them, we're making them less negative. Now, really, we're going to apply depolarization to any positive movement of the membrane potential. But if you want to be technically correct, you're not really depolarizing what you get above zero. You're reestablishing a positive polarity. But when you hear depolarization, think positive movement of the membrane potential. Repolarization is going back toward rest, and the after hyperpolarization, or any hyperpolarization, means they're now more negative than they were at rest. <clears throat> You can break down the action potential into three phases. There's the initial depolarization that occurs after we hit threshold. It's going to last about one millisecond. In the next millisecond, we'll have the second phase that's repolarization, where we go back toward rest. And in the final one to two milliseconds will be the after hyperpolarization, where the membrane potential is briefly held below the resting membrane potential. Action potentials have uniform amplitudes and generally uniform uh, durations as well. And that's because of the ion channels that are underlying the generation of action potentials. Even though each individual ion channel is going to act stochastically, so it's going to open and, and block or close uh, randomly, collectively, the entire population of ion channels is going to generate a fairly consistent timing and amplitude for action potentials. <clears throat> because of this, we have what we call the all or none principle. You either fire an action potential or you don't. Once you hit threshold, we'll see that that is going to drive further depolarization and you're going to hit a relatively uniform amplitude for the peak of your action potential. So when we're talking amplitude, it has nothing to do with the uh, stimulus that we're encoding. That has to do with uh, the, the intensity of the stimulus is encoded by frequency, not amplitude of the action potential. So if this is rest, say minus 70, we'll put threshold here. I don't know, we'll call it minus uh, 55 millivolts, something like that, positive 30 up here for the peak. If we were to fire another action potential right here, it would get up to the same amplitude as the original. <coughs> I don't know how well that's showing up on the camera. So they have relatively uniform amplitudes. What's driving this is, of course, a movement towards sodium's reversal. And the reversal for all ions is going to be considered constant because the ion concentrations are considered constant. If you need to review this, see lecture two. So we're going to get a uniform amplitude. So the height is always the same, but what differs is the frequency at which we fire. 
Every time we fire an action potential, we increase the likelihood that that neuron is going to release neurotransmitters. So consider every spike on this illustration here to be the release of neurotransmitter. Because that's why neurons fire action potentials. They don't do it for the fun of it. They do it to spit out neurotransmitters. So by delivering 160 picoamps of current, that's the top trace, no action potentials. Trace below it, 162 picoamps. Now we got above threshold, and we're going to fire an action potential as long as we have that depolarizing current. If you increase the uh, intensity of the stimulus, so now we're delivering 222 picoamps, notice the height of the action potentials hasn't changed, it's just the frequency. <clears throat> so when someone lightly taps you on the shoulder, or not so lightly taps you on the shoulder, the intensity is going to be encoded based on the frequency of firing, also how many fibers we're recruiting as well. Now we know that sodium is going to contribute to depolarization. Sodium in and potassium out for the repolarization. Sodium in for depolarization, potassium out for repolarization. <clears throat> we know this from a series of uh, experiments. Some involve ion replacement, so if you remove sodium from the bath, no more depolarization. Or, a little more uh, easier to see, you can use drugs. So in this case, tetrodotoxin can be applied to block voltage-gated sodium channels. Tetrodotoxin is a toxin that's made in pufferfish. The pufferfish itself doesn't really make it, but the stuff that it eats makes it. This is why farm-raised pufferfish are nowhere near as exciting to eat. But wild pufferfish that are eating the correct plankton are going to create, are going to have tetrodotoxin. And tetrodotoxin blocks voltage-gated sodium channels. So compare the action potential on top to the one below it. So I included the normal trace, that's the gray dotted line. Notice with TTX, it doesn't matter if we get above threshold, we're not going to have a spike. Because getting above threshold can't open up voltage-gated sodium channels. Tetraethyl ammonium is a molecule that's going to stick into potassium channels and block them, so it's going to block voltage-gated potassium channels. And what that's going to do is widen out the action potential. So if we prevent sodium from coming in, no action potential, just a little blip. If we prevent potassium from going out, that action potential is going to widen and we won't see it after hyperpolarization. We'll just see much slower repolarization. So, this tells us we're going to see first an initial sodium current followed by a delayed potassium current. And that's all an action potential is. We're going to be moving toward sodium's reversal and then we're going to be moving toward potassium's reversal. Now the reason that these uh, action potentials are going to fire when we hit threshold is because the ion channels involved are voltage gated, so not leak. These are going to open and close based on membrane potential. So when you hear gated, I want you to think of the membrane as a fence and ion channels are where we can open it. Now some openings in the fence don't have a gate, that'd be leak, but most openings in fences have gates. They can be opened to allow ions to move either by changing the membrane potential if they're voltage gated or applying neurotransmitters or some other ligand if they're ligand gated. The action potential is all about voltage gated sodium and potassium channels. Their structure is very similar but there's one critical difference. Voltage gated sodium channels are going to be made largely from a single polypeptide. That At least the alpha subunit is a single polypeptide. There's some beta subunits that we won't think about they're involved with trafficking. Forget about those. You can get a functional ion channel without the beta subunit. So the alpha subunit is the ion channel. The beta subunit is just there to make sure it goes to the right spot. But it's a single polypeptide compared to potassium channels that are four. This is a key distinction because being a single polypeptide, voltage-gated sodium channels have to have little loops within the cell and outside the cell to connect the different domains. So in both cases we're going to have four domains or four structural subunits
that are basically copies of each other. And within each of those, we're going to have six transmembrane domains. So, you can see in this illustration here, uh, on the top, it's kind of a cartoon representation of the, put, of the channel put together, and then it's broken apart on the bottom. Beta subunit is shown first. Forget about that. Then you have your alpha. That's the big chunk of it. Each subunit has six transmembrane domains. And a transmembrane domain is just a part or a domain that spans the membrane. <clears throat> In each of these domains, the fifth and sixth transmembrane domain are going to move toward the center and form the ion pore. The activation gate is going to be the fourth transmembrane domain. What it has is some positively charged amino acids that are going to respond to changes in membrane potential. So, when that sodium rushes in, remember what it's going to do. The first thing we do is line the membrane. So when we have depolarization, we're first going to line the membrane. And as charge is moving through the cell, the first thing it's going to do is line the membrane. So those positive charges that are at the membrane are going to be detected by proteins embedded in the membrane. And that's the purpose of that voltage sensor. <clears throat> those positive charges are going to cause it to move and pull open the ion pore. Now, between the third and fourth domains, we have an intracellular loop that's going to act as the inactivation gate. There's some hydrophobic amino acids there that are going to stick into the pore after it's opened. Here I've rearranged that drawing into a cartoon that I think is a little easier to see. So we have our kind of cross section and then a top-down view. Panel A is the closed voltage-gated sodium channel, so the fifth and sixth transmembrane domains are pointed toward the center to make the ion pour. Whenever we reach threshold potential, that fourth transmembrane domain scoots over and pulls open the pore, so now sodium can move through. The inactivation gate is going to then block the pore and prevent further movements of sodium. So what we're doing at threshold potential is opening up voltage-gated sodium channels. We're also going to open up voltage-gated potassium channels, but they're a little bit slower. Now the reason this is a threshold and action potentials are all or none is because sodium is going to drive further depolarization. Let's clean this up a bit. So whenever the membrane of the axon helix depolarizes because of the summation of synaptic currents, let's say, or it could be pacemaker currents, doesn't matter. That depolarization, when it hits threshold, that's going to be enough depolarization that the voltage sensor will detect it, move, and pull open the ion pore. And when we do that, we increase our sodium conductance. Anytime you increase the permeability to an ion, we're going to move our membrane potential toward the reversal of that ion. So we're going to go from our negative, let's say, 55 for threshold. It could be 50. It's variable. <clears throat> and we're going to approach, but probably, uh, but probably not reach, the reversal of sodium. But we will move toward it. In other words, we will depolarize. As we're depolarizing, all we're doing is increasing the probability of opening other voltage-gated sodium channels. So you can consider that they will all open up. When you hit threshold, that's just enough to open the, the, enough sodium channels to drive depolarization. Some sodium channels will open below threshold just by chance. And some won't open even after you cross threshold. Ion channels are going to be governed by random chance. We're, we're adjusting the probability. And when we hit threshold, we're essentially at 100% probability for opening. Because once we open a few, then we open the rest. Depolarization drives further depolarization, drives further depolarization. So we can assume that our sodium conductance is going to approach 100%.
its maximum value and we will get maximum depolarization. Again, giving us consistent amplitudes for the action potential. So this is a great plot and you should understand what's going on in it. It's showing you the first an increase in sodium conductance then a delayed increase in potassium conductance. When you open up sodium channels you get that inward sodium current and that drives depolarization. The outward potassium current is going to drive repolarization. But if we're going to properly repolarize we need to inactivate our voltage gated sodium channels. <clears throat> because they're a positive feedback loop. Depolarization drives depolarization, drives depolarization. We have to have some way of turning this off, and that's where that third intracellular loop comes in. <clears throat> so this does what any string of amino acids is going to do. It just kind of flops around. But the flopping is not random. There's um, a series of amino acids that I've listed there, which I'll never remember, that are going to act as a hinge. So they're going to restrict flopping into a single uh, well, not single, but they're going to restrict where the uh, peptide can flop around in. So it's not random anymore, it's more of a hinge. So after our channel opens, then this inactivation gate has a chance of flapping and landing in the ion pore. And when it does that, it sticks. And it sticks because of hydrophobic amino acids. So you're going to get hydrophobic interactions between ions in the pore and surrounding it, and that inactivation gate. And what that does is prevent anything from moving through the channel. So that's inactivation, which is different from deactivation. So this cartoon is showing you inactivation. The ion channels open, that IFM, those are hydrophobic uh, peptides there, those stick into the pore and now it's inactivated. It's not deactivated though. It doesn't deactivate until we drop below threshold. That's different. When it's inactivated, its ion pore is still open, it's just blocked. When it's deactivated, its ion pore is closed. And that can only occur whenever the voltage sensor no longer senses depolarization. So we have to drop below threshold. <clears throat> only after we drop below threshold can we deactivate? And we must deactivate in order to deinactivate. Please go through those terms a couple of times. <clears throat> they're confusing. But they're all different. So, we're activated, now we're inactivated. So we have to deactivate so we can deinactivate. If we don't close the pore, we never disrupt those hydrophobic interactions, and those are quite strong. So you're not going to get spontaneous deinactivation. It's going to be driven by deactivation. So we have to squeeze it out. Think of it that way. So in this cartoon schematic, in B we've opened. We're above threshold. In C we're inactivated. We're still above threshold so notice the ion pore is, is, is open. Those fifth and sixth transmembrane domains are still pulled out so we could conduct ions. And in D we deinactivate. So we we deactivate and then we deinactivate. If we don't drop below threshold and allow for deinactivation to take place, if we deactivate and then activate again, so if we try to fire another action potential before we have deinactivated, no ions will move. So we have to drop below threshold potential and wait some unknown period of time. It's it's different every time for deinactivation to occur. <clears throat> Here's that same plot. We're going to be walking through this in this lecture, so you should kind of get used to looking at it. So where we're at here, if you'll look at the, uh, yes, the uh, sodium conductance, so the second set of lines there, notice it's starting to drop. That's because of inactivation. We're going to start to see de-inactivation, not in any of the currents or anything like that. That's going to be a relatively silent event. You're going to have to go to the uh, cartoon on the bottom showing you the activation and inactivation gates of sodium and potassium channels. So that's going to happen. The, the deactivation and de-inactivation is going to happen after we drop below threshold. So this allows us to generate 
complete spike before we could possibly generate another one. So that inactivation of the sodium channel is going to prevent further depolarization. It's going to help drive repolarization, but what's really going to drive that is an increase in potassium conductance. Now, potassium channels have a very similar structure, but like I said, there are four different, sub, uh, four different polypeptides. Not one, like sodium channels. So there's no intracellular and extracellular loops. As such, no inactivation gate. Same ion pore, same activation gate, same number of transmembrane domains. So they're still, in this case, they're, they're a full-blown tetramer, so four domains, but they're really distinct polypeptides. And each has six transmembrane domains. So very much the same as sodium channels, except no inactivation gate, and they're slower. They are what we call the delayed rectifier. So notice, the sodium conductance comes on before the potassium conductance. What that does is allow for depolarization, then repolarization. So if they opened up together, they would fight one another. So sodium channels open first to get depolarization. They inactivate, and potassium channels open up to drive repolarization. But those potassium channels are slow. Like I said, they're delayed rectifiers. So they don't close immediately whenever we drop below threshold. They remain open for some period of time. And that's what drives our after hyperpolarization because our potassium conductance is still greater than at rest. We have some voltage gated potassium channels that are still open. If you'll go back to your Goldman Hodgkin Katz equation and plug in a pk value that's greater than 1, you'll notice that your membrane potential hyperpolarizes. It moves toward potassium's reversal. So, where does potassium reverse? In the AHP, Vm is moving toward Vk, and that's going to be negative 102. <clears throat> we're not going to get there, but we're going to go below rest, because we have a higher permeability to potassium. So the inactivation of voltage-gated sodium channels and this after hyperpolarization are going to come together to create the refractory period. So the refractory periods are going to be the absolute and relative refractory periods. This, along with myelination, is going to shape how we can initiate and propagate action potentials. So <clears throat> action potentials are going to be generated in the axon hillock. So that's the, uh, so at the initial uh, segment of the axon. So cell body is going to have uh, dendrites coming off, and it's going to have a single axon emerging at the axon hillock. And then, it's probably easier if I draw this. Right. We've got our dendrites here, single axon, single axon coming off. And then within the axon, there's the axon initial segment. So just off the cell body. <coughs> filled up with sodium channels, ready to initiate an action potential. We have the initial segment. So there's a couple reasons why this is ideal for generating an action potential. First of all would be the density of sodium channels, which we've already covered. Now let's turn our attention to that thin, small diameter. The, the internal diameter is going to determine the internal resistance. This is Ohm's law backwards, V equals IR. So the currents flowing in from the dendrites are going to give an amplified membrane potential change because of the high resistance. So we're going to funnel these currents into a very thin axon filled with sodium channels. We're going to create a larger potential change, and then that's going to be enough to hit above threshold. So we're generating our action potentials in the initial segment of the axon, and they're going to travel down the axon. They'll back propagate as well, but we'll just think of them traveling down the axon. The rate at which we can generate action potentials is going to be determined by our refractory periods. Now the absolute refractory period is the period of time where you can absolutely, under no condition, not even in the lab, drive another action potential. 
and that's because our sodium channels are still inactivated. So once they start inactivating from here, once we hit threshold, then we have a possibility that we could start to deactivate and de-inactivate. But remember, ion channels are going to function based on probabilities. So the probability that they are all deactivated here would be zero. <clears throat> and what we're going to do is slowly ramp up that probability. Once we have deactivated, now we are outside the absolute refractory period and we enter the relative refractory period which we should think of as basically our after hyperpolarization. The AHP is the RRP. After hyperpolarization is the relative refractory period. <clears throat> Here you could generate another action potential because we have deactivated our voltage gated sodium channels. So since we've removed the activation gate, if we open, we could conduct ions and create a spike. In the absolute refractory period, if we open up again with depolarization, if we haven't deactivated, no sodium current. You won't get anything. The relative refractory period is going to be a period when it's more difficult to generate action potentials. And that's because, first of all, we're hyperpolarized, so we're below rest. So we're further away from threshold potential than we were at rest. We also have a higher potassium conductance, meaning it's going to be more difficult to depolarize because when we depolarize we move away from potassium's reversal and that only increases its driving force. So we have further to go and it's harder to get there because of this elevated potassium conductance. But you can do it in the relative refractory period. You just need a very strong stimulus to do that. <clears throat> so after activating we're going to get inactivation of voltage gated sodium channels. So again they open up, our inactivation gate sticks into the pore, and this prevents further depolarization until we drop below threshold potential. And what that does is help uh, keep the action potential as a single event moving pretty much one way down the axon. It'll backfire into the dendrites, but as far as the axon is concerned, it's going to go down to the end. So if you look at this cartoon here, what I've done is try to show you over time, going from top to bottom, the movement of charge. And I've color coded it so green is depolarized, red is hyperpolarized. <clears throat> it's not until we're actually into the AHP that we could maybe start to generate another action potential. And by the time we get there, the depolarization from the action potential is already further down the axon. So while we're going to get charge spreading in both directions, so let's say we had an action potential that's moving this way. Uh, we'll just call it myelinated so we can just see distinct units. <clears throat> so whenever we're depolarizing here, we're bringing sodium in. It's going to spread in both directions. The sodium that gets here is going to encounter inactivated voltage-gated sodium channels. Over here, here we're going to encounter the naive sodium channels that haven't been opened up yet. So when the charge arrives, it can actually lead to an increase in sodium conductance and we can bring in more charge. After this charge has left, and we bring in new charge here, well that will spread back too, but by the time it gets here, our sodium channels, if they're no longer activated, then they will be inactivated. And the only time that they're going to be de-inactivated is after the action potential is done. So we get a single event moving down the axon. If it didn't inactivate, we could potentially uh, just depolarize the entire axon and never repolarize it, or at least be very, very slow repolarization. So the 
Inactivation of voltage-gated sodium channels is going to speed up the frequency at which neurons can fire action potentials. Without inactivation, we have a couple possibilities. If it's just partial uh, lack of inactivation, we're going to widen out the action potential. If it's complete inability, uh, we may very well remain in depolarization for several seconds. Uh, potentially killing the neuron. <clears throat> so our absolute refractory period uh, is actually a very good thing. It allows the action potential to move in one direction and also speeds up the action potential so that we get sharper spikes because we get rid of our sodium conductance that's bringing us up here to depolarizing potentials and allowing us to then repolarize more rapidly. The relative refractory period is caused by the AHP. Like I said, I've actually already gone through this, so I'm going to gloss over this. Myelination is going to speed up action potential propagation. And it's also going to increase the efficiency. So we're going to be moving far fewer ions in myelinated axons, because we can only move ions at the nodes. In areas where we have myelin, we don't have any ion channels. So we can't move ions across the membrane. Now this is not drawn to scale. I want you to keep in mind that the nodes of Ranvier are only about 2 microns in length. But our internodes are going to be 300 to 2,000 microns in length. So we're dealing with anywhere between a little under 1% to 0.1% of the length that moves ions. So most of the axon, over 99% of the axon uh, length is going to be devoid of ion channels. So we'll be moving far fewer ions. And when we move fewer ions down their concentration gradient, we have fewer ions to pump back across the membrane. That means the ATP cost is going to be reduced, and the odds of oxidative stress occurring reduced. What we'll do is speed up the rate of action potential propagation roughly tenfold, and decrease the ATP cost about 75-fold. What we'll get are these areas of passive, rapid propagation, and then slower areas of active repropagation of the action potential. So at the nodes, we open up ion channels. It's a little slower, I suppose, than the passive movement of charge. So people call it saltatory conduction. Saltatory is based off the Latin saltare, which means to leap. So it's going to leap from node to node. So it's going to glide along those internodes because of the negligible capacitance of the membrane here. So with myelination, we're going to wrap layer upon layer of myelin onto the axon. So we're going to be separating our charges by a much greater distance. And therefore, the ability for charge within the axon to interact with extracellular charges has been lost. So we're no longer needing to charge the membrane, it can just move on down to the next node. <clears throat> so, sodium and potassium are, like I said, the bread and butter ion channels of the action potential, but since we're mammals, I thought it might be nice to talk about some additional conductances that you'll find in mammalian neurons. We'll start off with a fairly simple one, that would be the persistent sodium currents. These are exactly what they sound like. They're sodium currents that persist. So even at rest, we have a sodium current. Now, in your cartoon neuron, this is very low, about 4% of the potassium current at rest. But not every neuron is going to rest down at minus 70. Some are going to rest basically at threshold, minus 55. And that's because they have a high degree of persistent sodium current. So here's a neuron that has a high level of persistent sodium current. You'll notice it's resting basically at minus 55 and firing action potentials. Whenever a, a persistent sodium current blocker is applied, no more action potentials. <clears throat> now it could just be blocking every voltage-gated sodium channel, but we'll assume it isn't. And when you wash it out, activity resumes. So when you remove the drug, neuron can fire action potentials. Truth be told, <clears throat> it's not really clear where persistent sodium current comes from. We think that it's conducted through voltage-gated sodium channels that either 
only partially activate or they fail to inactivate. <coughs> Did I say partially activate? I meant partially inactivate. So they open up, they don't quite close all the way. And that sodium current keeps the cell kind of near enough threshold that I guess they stay open. It's kind of a mystery, uh, that persistent sodium current. It's a mystery where it comes from, but it's very straightforward what it does. It depolarizes the cell. Another current that depolarizes the cell is HCN current. You'll also hear it called H current or queer current. H current meaning HCN or hyperpolarizing current. But the fact that you get depolarizing currents with hyperpolarization was odd to the people who first characterized it. So they called it queer current. So this is strange. You give a hyperpolarizing current and the neuron depolarizes. It didn't make any sense to them. But it makes a whole lot of sense if you know about HCN channels, which they didn't at the time, but they discovered them. So now we know about them. So that H current is going to be brought on by hyperpolarization, and that's what these data are showing us. So what they're doing is <clears throat> hyperpolarizing the cell by delivering negative currents, and they're looking at the amount of uh, 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 potential. So they're, let's see, <clears throat> they're getting what we call a voltage sag. So when you deliver, in this case they deliver their depolarizing current, they fired some action potentials, something like that. When they deliver hyperpolarizing currents, the cell hyperpolarizes. And what they notice when they hyperpolarize it enough, they start to see this initial, what they call, voltage sag. It sags down. And that's because they had to, to deliver additional negative current because of the activation of HCN channels. So let's break down their name here. So they are activated by hyperpolarization, which is really nifty, and they're gated by cyclic nucleotides, things like cyclic AMP, which will be stimulated by GS receptors, things like that. So different metabotropic receptors can affect how active HCN channels are. And what HCN channels do is drive steady pacemaking. Because in, during that after hyperpolarization, what that does is lead to depolarization. Because HCN channels are monovalent cation channels. So they're going to reverse around minus 30 millivolts, which is well above threshold. So when we hyperpolarize, we activate our HCN channels, and that drives depolarization, which then leads to another spike and another after hyperpolarization, and another spike, and another after hyperpolarization, and another spike. And you get the point. So you get steady pacemaking. What you can see over here is what happens to a steady pacemaker cell if you block HCN channels. So that's what the ZD, whatever the numbers are there, is going to do. It's going to block HCN channels. So we get action potentials, but you'll notice they're not as steady in the presence of this HCN blocker. Potassium currents are very diverse. There are more potassium channels than any other kind of ion channel out there. Now I know I just told you that voltage-gated uh, potassium channels don't inactivate, uh, but some do. I lied. Uh, it's just classically, uh, in the axon, they, they don't. Uh, but in this example, they do. Uh, so in, you know, in dendrite cell bodies, you're going to have a, a different ion channels in different parts of the neuron. So inactivating potassium currents are going to lead to a slow increase in firing. So there will be an initial period of, um, of silence followed by action potential firing. So in, in A1, in the top there, what they're doing is delivering 
depolarizing currents, and you'll notice right away the neuron isn't firing an action potential, and that's because of inactivating potassium channels. So, because our inactivating potassium channels are open, we have a higher permeability to potassium, and thus we're moving toward its reversal. We're resisting the firing of action potentials. But this inactivates. So that amount of potassium conductance is going to decrease over time until finally you'll notice the neuron starts to fire its, its action potentials. So it delays the onset of action potentials in response to depolarizing inputs. So it's going to shape the firing pattern of neurons that have them. In A2, what they've done is express a dominant negative version of this inactivating potassium channel, and you'll notice right away it starts firing action potentials. Because the dominant negative version turns off all the normal ones. And in the bottom, they're expressing a mutant form that doesn't inactivate as well, so the potassium current is more long-lived, and so there's a longer delay before it starts to fire its action potentials. We also have slowly activating potassium currents, which will basically do the opposite of that. They're going to allow the neuron to be excited more at the beginning, and then they'll come on to silence the neuron. And that's what we're seeing here. <clears throat> These are going to be affected by um, muscarinic receptors. So when they apply muscarin here, that can close the slowly activating potassium current. So that's what you're seeing on the right. So on the left, A, that's control in voltage clamp and current clamp. So only in current clamp are we going to see the actual potentials. What I want you to do is compare A to B. Okay, so with muscarin, those end channels are going to be closed. So we get a, a, a smaller potassium current. That's what we're measuring there. And then look on the bottom, those two purple panels. On the left, what we get is an initial spike followed by silence. And that's because we have slowly activating potassium currents. So at the beginning, when they are not quite activated, we have a narrow window of time where we can fire action potentials. So this changes the firing pattern of neurons to be strong in the beginning and weaker later. When you inhibit them with muscarin, you can see there, fairly steady firing of action potentials. And that calcium activated potassium currents are going to contribute to burst firing. So when neurons fire a lot of action potentials, there's going to be a buildup of calcium. And that buildup of calcium then triggers potassium currents to activate. Now calcium, in this regard, can thus prevent action potential firing because it stimulates potassium conductances. But it can also stimulate the firing of action potentials because calcium channels are going to cause strong depolarization. Now you'll see calcium channels in presynaptic terminals, but you'll find them elsewhere in cells as well. And the reversal potential for potassium is going to wear, be somewhere in the ballpark, oh, I forget, 120 millivolts or something like that. Very depolarized, in other words, well above threshold. And there's a host of different calcium channels out there. There's transient, there's long-lived ones. <clears throat> Whenever you have voltage-gated calcium channels driving action potentials, you tend to see bursts because you get very strong depolarization. That burst and the calcium influx that occurs then drives calcium-gated potassium channels to open. Now these things are really nifty, these, these calcium-gated potassium channels. It prevents neurons from exciting themselves to death because when calcium builds up, well, the cell has to buffer this, and one of the big buffers for that would be mitochondria, and you don't want to permeabilize your mitochondria. So you want to keep the calcium bursts to a minimal. You want to make them transient. So when the neuron fires a burst, and our calcium levels build up, this will be the concentration of calcium in this case, what that does is then stimulate the um, calcium-gated potassium currents to then activate. 
potassium. Remember, potassium is going to reverse at... Oh, Jesus. Sorry. Potassium is going to reverse at roughly minus 100 millivolts. So as we increase this potassium current, we're going to see the cessation of the burst. So we'll get bursts and pauses. When you see bursts and pause, the most likely candidate to cause that pause is going to be a calcium-gated potassium channel. <clears throat> so that potassium current, of course, moves the membrane potential toward potassium's reversal, which is very much hyperpolarizing, and that puts a stop to the burst. And that puts a stop to today's lecture. So when we generate the action potential, that's going to run down the axon and we're going to get neurotransmitter release. We'll cover that in lecture six, but in the next lecture, lecture four, we're going to be thinking about what happens in the dendrites whenever neurotransmitters are released and we get electrical currents generated. How do they move around in dendrites? Because that is going to affect whether or not neurons then fire action potentials. If you have any questions on today's material, fill out that questions box. I'll see you in class.